Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, basically, I am going to emphasize the huge challenge in African urbanization and how Africa could learn much from Latin America, which was perhaps the most recent urbanization process, not so much for what we did well, but on the contrary, for what we did wrong, that they could avoid. Now, uh, clearly I think nothing is more important today than making the cities right, because once they are made, it's difficult to change them. If we save land for a park, it will make people happier for uh, hundreds of years. If we don't save it, it will be less happy for hundreds of years as well. The way growing cities are made will determine how happy people will live, how much peace there will be, how competitive these societies are, uh, how efficient and low global warming mobility is, how sustainable the world is. Now we have been talking about Switzerland and Singapore, so I'll say that every eight months, sub-Saharan Africa population increases 14 million, which is the total population of Switzerland plus Singapore combined. Every eight months. Now, new cities constructed in developed, on undeveloped land could be totally different and better than even the best existing cities today. For example, we could have thousands of kilometers of greenways crisscrossing the cities in all directions, which is difficult to do in London, but it's easy to do in new African cities. But equity is the biggest obstacle or challenge to achieve these kind of things. Most sub-Saharan Africa's population will multiply between 10 and 20 times over the next 75 years. But the cities will grow much more than proportional to population growth maybe twice, three times as much. For example, Ethiopia, I'm interested, I just was in Ethiopia recently, so I was only 23% urban at this time. It has 120 million inhabitants. But so in Colombia, for example, in the transition from going from 31% urban to 82% urban, that is today, Colombia's main city's population multiplied by more than 20%. So something similar, or whatever you can change, the scale will going to happen in, in Africa. But other sub-Saharan countries are also very little urbanized. For example, these are some numbers. All the most 50% or something like that, most of them less than 50%. Uh, but even in the transition from Colombia, 50% urban, to today's 82% urban, Bogota, my city's population multiplied four times, and the area of the city eight times, just from 50% urban to 80% urban. Now, Ethiopian city's population will grow by more than 15 times. Some city's population will grow 20 times. Addis Ababa's population will grow at least eight times, which is five million, from 5 million today to 40 or 50 million. But cities will grow much more than proportionate to population growth because households will be smaller. So if houses are two, half as large, we'll need twice as many homes for the same people. Also because as cities become wealthier, there is more non-housing buildings such as universities or offices or warehouses. Uh, and also because there is a, a, a housing deficit today that has to be solved. It's a, it, what has been found by, by many studies is that if a city's population grows 10 times, the land occupied grows around 20 times, twice as much, at least. Now, another way of looking at it is that less than 5% of what sub-Saharan African cities will be in 75 years has yet to be built. It's only 5% has been built, 95% is what will be built. But the, this process, of course, is not just happening in sub-Saharan Africa. For example, in India, urban, urbanization is only 37% in India today. Or Egypt, 43%. Vietnam, 38% urban. But I'm just going to concentrate on what is happening in sub-Saharan Africa. To confront sub-Saharan Africa's urbanization challenges successfully, I think we, think, we, can think, we have to think different. 
because we are very poor. Just to, we were, we were talking about the economies of these wealthy countries such as Switzerland. The economy of Switzerland plus Singapore added up together is 1,000% larger than all sub-Saharan Africa economy. 1,000%, just Switzerland. But, uh, so, now, the most important... <laughs> I, don't, I have to go quick because I've been threatened to be caught. So, <laughs> the most important objective of African cities, my proposal, is to avoid slums. Uh, today, half, half of the urban population of sub-Saharan Africa, about 300 million people, lives in informal settlements or, or slums. 500 million more could live in slums over the next 50 years if nothing else is done. And I can talk about slums because I worked a lot with slums improvement in my city. I know what this is about. This is not just in a book that I saw. It. Slums are not only causing suffering today. They create a city that grows in the wrong places, a city without adequate public space for roads, parks, public buildings, uh, when I became mayor of Bogota the first time in 1998, around 50% of the city was made of settlements that had been informal or were still informal. They were in the wrong locations, insufficient public spaces, many lacked water, sewage, pavements. Now, this is the kind of things we had in Bogota. We have still in Bogota, not because we are in the mountains. We have a lot of level land. This is the people they, themselves making their own, building their own homes, heroes. There is only one reason why slums exist. Lack of access of the poor to well-located legal land. Governments cannot provide computers to all households or refrigerators or motorcycles, and not even medical treatments to everybody. But they can provide well-located land. Land is there. Private property and the market do not work well in the case of growing cities. The beauty of the market is that when prices go up, for example, if the price of tomatoes go up, then people grow more tomatoes, supply increases, and the price goes down. But in the case of land around growing cities, we can increase the price. All we want and the supply of land that is accessible to uh, education, jobs, Recreation does not increase. So the market does not work. For the case, the private property and the market do not work in the case of land around growing cities. If government owns the land, it can provide well-located plots, even if at first they don't have water or sewage, but they at least they leave enough spaces for the city to, once it's completely legalized, to be fine. And it can save large spaces for future roads and abundant parks. In Ethiopia, it's a very peculiar case because it's one country where the land is publicly owned, so there are no slums. And it's a, but it's rather an exception in Africa. Bogota has hundreds of thousands of well-located level land, but it belonged to a few wealthy uh, people who kept a few cows while millions of poor people were forced to find homes in the mountains in very poorly located informal settlements. This is what should not happen in Africa. I mean, we did the stupidest thing, and it could easily be avoided if there is clarity and political decision. When I be let's get... Uh, <laughs> Bogotá's informal settlements are somewhat better than those in Africa or in some Asian cities, that they have streets. They, at least they have saved the space for streets. Uh, then we have put the sewage. Bogota, of course, has wealthy neighborhoods. But we concentrated, and Bogota has concentrated all our efforts in the poorest ones. Bogota's wealthy neighborhoods pay a high, income, high property taxes, about, for example, around two monthly rentals per year. But all of these uh, people, for example, they, they send their children to private schools, they use private health, uh, private nurseries. So all the taxes that are paid here are invested in the poor area. 
Informal settlements improvements that we did, legalization, for example, property titles, water supply, sewage, housing improvements programs, pavements, schools, parks. And I am very proud because of all the legalized neighborhoods in Bogotá since 1954, I as mayor legalized one third of all that, five times more than the next mayor did. I was obsessed with this issue. <laughs> so this is, for example, uh, this is neighborhoods not in the mountains, but in the low-lying areas which used to flood. And so here is a bicycle highway we'll talk about later. This is a park that we made in this. This is some very nice, fantastic schools. Here even a community center, even with swimming pools, indoor swimming pools, because it's cool there. Uh, see, you can see the kind of schools we made up there. Uh, this, as good as the ones in the upper income private schools. Uh, these kind of things in the many parks, hundreds of parks. Of course, for doing these parks, we had to buy some of those ho houses to demolish and to make space for parks like this. Uh, hundreds of parks. But we did also soft informal improvements. For example, tens of thousands of bougainvillea planted that which they will go huge in the future, uh, or paintings, hundreds of thousands of uh, facades, painting with the community themselves, who making even sometimes like a butterfly or something. Uh, now, but the goal, of course, is not just to improve the informal settlements, but to avoid them. So in my case, we did two large land intervention projects. One is the Metro Vivienda, Recreo Por Venir, and Lagos de Torca. I cannot go into the details of explaining. The first part was just outright buying, forcefully buying land around the city using eminent domain if it was necessary. And the other was somewhat sophisticated. But in my two terms, we made projects for more than half a million people. Now, but in Africa, they need perhaps much more radical schemes because the challenge is much bigger. I would say that they need to have huge amounts of government-owned land around growing cities, or else the mess will get worse. This is the kind of projects we did in Bogota, in, uh, where we bought forcefully land, like uh, land reform, like good sidewalks, which is an exception in Bogota, rather than, uh, for example, many of these homes, they will, we would put one or two floors, and the people themselves, they were designed so the people themselves would build one or two additional floors. Uh, this is the Lago de Torca project, a more recent one. This is under construction for about uh, for nearly 400,000 people. Now, but privately owned land not only leads to poorly located informal settlements, it also leads to poorly located formal settlements. And all over the Latin America, we see this. I don't have time to go into that detail now. Slomo Angel, a wonderful guy, most of you must have read his books, has proposed that public land at least should be at least we should have saved public land for roads and parks, at least, if not for all the housing. But anyway, inequality is most felt during leisure time. During work, during work time, the president of the company or the person who cleans the toilets, they both are more or less equally satisfied. They go, they meet their friends. The huge difference is when they leave uh, for their leisure time. The, a upper income person goes to a large house, has access to restaurants, to the theater, to vacations, to sports, and the low income person goes to a very small home and the only alternative to television or maybe to the phone they have is public pedestrian space. So it's the most important part by far of a city that where we can want to create equality. The most important infrastructure of a democratic city are sidewalks. You may think in here in Singapore or in, in Zurich that sidewalks are very obvious. No. It's almost a characteristic by all developing cities not to have decent sidewalks. I would say that in developing cities, in including my own, somebody on a wheelchair cannot go from one corner to the other in more than 10% of the streets. I had a war. I was almost impeached for getting cars off where there should be sidewalks. This is some of the higher income areas in Bogota. My first term in 98 as mayor, we made this thing. Sidewalks, we got them out. 
it was only 10% of the people who had cars, but they were the most powerful, richest 10% of the population. So if anybody thinks it's easy to get cars off the sidewalks or where there should be sidewalks, I dare them to do it. <laughs> this is what we made, and uh, many more, of course, we don't have time. Also parks, we made hundreds of parks, hundreds of parks. I must say also that I'm very proud of I got more land for parks than all the mayors in the history of Bogota added up together. <laughs> and I was only mayor for eight years, and even less, seven years. Now, parts like this in the low-income neighborhoods. Uh, in this case, we have democracy. Democracy means that public good prevails over private interest. In this case, for example, we turned the polo fields and the riding stables of the most exclusive country club in the country where the richest people and the most powerful people are members, and we turn into a public park. This is, again, not very easy. <laughs> this is in Nairobi. This is a Kibera slum, or a informal settlement. But what is always a, very interesting to me, this is the slum where you have one of the highest densities in the planet, and then here you have a, a golf course, I mean, the obvious democratic thing to do is to turn this golf course into a park, you know? It's not communism, it's, but try doing it. <laughs> now, we made a whole network of bikeways when I became mayor in 98, much before Paris or New York had uh, bikeways. Now everybody's doing bikeways all over the planet, but we did it much before most people. Of course, the Netherlands and Denmark always had them, but most of the, the rest of the world not. Again, was a difficult battle. But for us, it was not because of environmental reasons, but equity reasons. A uh, bikeway shows that a citizen on a $50 bike is equally important to one on a $50,000 car. We were trying to construct democracy. And so now Bogota has almost one million bicycle trips every day, even though we have a lot of rain. And cool rain, not warm rain like Singapore's. <laughs> we are up in the mountain, 2,600 meters of altitude, it's cold. Now, a protected bike we raises the social status of the cyclist. You know, he feels proud, you know. Now, the only means of individual mobility different than walking accessible to 90% of sub-Saharan Africa, Africans is the bicycle. So often those who could afford motorcycles even they cannot buy one because they are not allowed. For example, the rich people in Addis Ababa, they don't want the poor people in motorcycles bothering them. So they did something very simple, as in Chinese cities. They just ban them. No motorcycles are allowed. Easy. Now, uh, this is the bikeway, some of the bikes we have in Bogota. As you see, it's rainy. Our BRT system, I will tell you about quickly. Uh, I will tell, show you a project that could be done in all the growing cities in Africa that we did very quickly. In the areas where the city was growing, we did, for example, this 24-kilometer bicycle highway. And Bogota is a very high-density city, 240 inhabitants per hectare, almost the same as Manhattan. Before the city grew, and so this, I am very proud of this picture because you see it's a high quality, fancy, pedestrian, even underground cables, and the car in the mud. <laughs> first, so first, this was crazy. This was in 98, you know, it was not now. Then the city grows around the bicycle highway. And see, this is, uh, and so this would be very easy to do in Africa. Thousands of kilometers of these things. So I hear there are many architects here. I, will, I, I cannot avoid making this comment. We, the, there are some architects here who got his di diploma in Atamal, you know? Look, they made these homes here, and they don't put windows against the park side, you know? <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> they did not study here, of course. <laughs> now. Uh, this is the bicycle highway in operation today. Tens of thousands of people use it now every day. Uh, this is another bicycle highway we built as well. Uh, we have now like 120 
kilometers, which in a very dense city like ours is difficult to make because it's not like, like Suri, full of green all over. No, this is very high density. This is the kind of things we could easily do in Africa. Very easy, cost nothing if we plan it from the start. Why not one, one pedestrian street for every car street? Or at least one pedestrian street for every 10 car streets? Something like that. London cannot do it, but they can do it easily now. Mass transport for sub-Saharan Africa, again, is a matter of equity. This is what we had in Bogota when I became mayor, a mess, complete mess, almost individually on buses racing against each other. It's like, uh, this is what we created, uh, inspired by Curitiba system, but much improved. This system, it, again, is democracy at work. If all citizens are equal, a bus with 200 passengers has a right to a 200 times more road space than a car with one. It's uh, now, again, here, for example, if you have a $200,000 car stuck in traffic and then the, a child in the public transport goes <laughs> next. This is democracy at work, again. We are, but then to have it, uh, public transport going, and I believe that as much as possible, you should not put public transport users on the ground, as much as possible. Bicycle parking in this system, this system is now moving. This is just if, if I took it, this going to the airport. This is, we are moving 2.4 million passengers every day in 114 kilometers. We move more passengers per kilometer than practically all subways in the world. And it costs 20 times less per kilometer than a subway. Subways are wonderful, I love them, but they're expensive. You know? Of course, for example, if we had invested in subway instead of BRT, this is all what we could have done with the same money, or, el, or all the black network. But of course, it's a political decision. Get the cars out of one lane in a developing country city to see how difficult it is again. I was just in Addis Ababa last week, as I told you. So this was very, because upper income people in all developing cities, they want rail, they want a subway. All upper income people in every developing city, but they have not the slightest intention of ever getting into one of those things. They just want the low income people to go there. So they, here, for example, of course, railway, so, railway sales salesmen are wonderful, and there is a lot of corruption involved. And I love subways. I say, I contracted the first subway line in Bogota, which is under construction now. I, so I love subways too. But now, this. You know, they don't have money in Avisa Beba to do maintenance. So this extremely expensive thing is moving 50,000 passengers per day because all the trains are broken and they don't have money to put them to work. Now, uh, this is what says Wikipedia about this rail system in, in Addis Abeba. By 2023, the system averaged 56,000 passengers, and I think maybe this has cost the same as our system and moves 2.4 million passengers per day. Now, let's go quickly. Again, this is it's very important that in a stations they have two lanes so that they can, you can have express trains, express buses that don't stop at every station, and then local buses that stop at every station. Oh. More and more is expanding. Now there's projects on Every major since I was major has expanded. Now it's, it's being expanded by 60% at this time. This is more BRT under construction, more. It will be 60% more in a, in a matter of two years. I would say that in terms of mobility, an advanced city is not one where even the poor have cars, but one where even the rich use public transport. In a great city, if we really want to measure what a great city is, Nobody should feel inferior or excluded. You here are studying very sophisticated environmental challenges and things, but here we have some very basic challenges, which mostly more than science are political, very difficult political challenges. Thank you. <laughs>